This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. What's up, Detroit sports fans? Welcome to the Fan Report, a show made by fans for fans, powered by the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I'm Nick, and joining me today is Andrew's going to give us this week's topics. The Lions and Falcons gave fans a nail-biter of finish on Sunday, but Lions fans seem split on the result. They also seem split on paying Kenny Galladay. So we'll try and navigate the divide on this episode of the Fan Report. Oh, and James Edwards and Zach Lowe both seem to think there's a market for Blake Griffin, so we'll talk about that too. It's the Fan Report. Well... It was an interesting weekend uh, for the Lions. We are now on a two-game winning streak in three uh-huh. of the last four. Uh, I mean, it, are we throwing a party? I think isn't this the first time they've won back-to-back games since like super early 2019 or 2018 or something I like mean, that? Yeah, beginning of last season, I believe they strung a couple together. But other yeah. than that, I don't think they've done that. Other than that, under Matt Patricia, so right. We were used to seeing runs on both going both directions under uh, Caldwell, yeah. <laughs> uh, but kind of kicking things off with this Lions Falcons game, I, it's it did not go as expected. Let, let's well, let's start with all. that. The I, I mean the over the score to be double right. The over under <laughs> of this game, the the over the total over under total for this game was fifty five was fifty five, and yep. it it didn't hit that. It hit forty five. Uh, it hit forty five. <laughs> right. It was it fell short of that mark by you know quite a bit. I was expecting at least two more touchdowns from each team. I was too. And in all honesty, it didn't look like either quarterback really was dialed in. Yes, I know both quarterbacks threw for over 300 yards. Each team, I believe, had four receivers over 50 yards as well. Mm -hmm. But it didn't seem like any But only one passing touchdown for each? Like, who saw that coming? Right. And it didn't seem like either team was really able to sustain a significant drive and put it in the end zone after, you know, gaining a bunch of yards. It it, it looked like a a struggle bus after, uh, you know, stalling big time when it looked like something could happen. Uh, and, and that was kind of surprising just because neither one of these defenses is, for lack of better terms, elite. Yeah. <laughs> uh, neither defense is really all that great. It's not like either team turned the ball over very much. The, nope. the Falcons only had one turnover, and then the Lions didn't turn the ball over at all. So, it, you know, mistakes like that weren't prevalent. There there wasn't yeah. a ton of them. And, and mm-hmm. yeah, there were some penalties on each side. I mean, the Lions were penalized five times for 50 yards, and The Falcons eight for 53. So there were some uh, penalties to go around. But for the most part, it just seemed like both teams just kind of struggled to be consistent on the offensive side of the ball, which was something that was really kind of surprising. I mean, they were dead Mm -hmm. even almost in yard in yard totals with 386 for lines, 388 for the Falcons. So Mm -hmm. they played very similar games. And I feel like we just come to expect that when Matthew Stafford and Matt Ryan come on, come to the football field and play against (laughs) each other. But just kind of well, surprising to see the way that this game kind of turned out. You no, know, what it looked like to me was that both teams really struggled to establish the run, and it just they both teams were able to get comfortable just sitting back and playing the pass, and they were both teams were I guess playing the pass relatively well. I don't understand either how I don't understand how the Lions were able to hold Gurley two and a half yards to carry. I don't understand how DeAndre Swift couldn't run better against this Falcons front. Like I don't, I don't, I don't understand how that happened on either side. It makes zero sense to me. I mean, combined, <laughs> these two teams went for two point three or two point seven five yards per carry. Basically, yeah. it, the Lions went for three yards mm-hmm. carry, and the uh, Falcons two and a half. Like it, yeah. it was not a pretty game. And again, rushing totals damn near the exact same: sixty six for the Falcons, sixty four for the Lions. Mm-hmm. So neither team got the running game going at yeah. all, at all. And like, I was actually really impressed with how our pass pro was going in the first half. Like Julio was basically non-existent, and Calvin Ridley came up with like a couple of big catches. But other than that, like it wasn't it wasn't anything much. It was Hayden Hurst. I was really killing us, to be honest with you. But um, in the second half, like it, I think both teams started getting in more of a rhythm. You saw Kenny Galladay get more involved on the on the Falcon side. You saw Julio and Calvin get, uh, Calvin Ridley get more involved. Yeah, it was. It was the un, it was an unexpected slugfest, is what it felt like. But the question here is, with such a nail biting yet ugly win, this puts us at three and three. And let me know if I'm jumping the gun if you want to get into some more minute stuff before. But this is putting us at three and three, facing the Colts next week, and then a pretty favorable string of games after that. A lot of Lions fans are unhappy with this. A lot of Lions fans are really happy back at 500. I'm just curious, Nick, where do you stand on that divide? 
I mean, yes, it was an ugly game, but this is the NFL and it's an any given mm-hmm. Sunday cut type of league. So, I mean, a win is a win. I, I am in the boat of, though, I, I still don't believe that this is a very good football team. And I'm referring to the Lions. They, they barely beat. They honestly, in all reality, should have lost this game to the Falcons. I mean, should it have. makes no sense how the Falcons didn't kneel the ball when they were like on the 10 yards. Why line. Todd Gurley all no of a sudden? Timeouts. It's it's like Todd Gurley <laughs> forgot how to handle a game situation and was like, "Oh shit, last second. And by the way, Will Harris almost screwed that up. He, screwed he, up. he he had Gurley fully wrapped. <laughs> like, right, right. Like, what are you doing? Like, it, it literally <laughs> seemed as a, a way f- where both teams tried to lose every way mm-hmm. they possibly could, and then mm-hmm. the Falcons just said, "Hold my beer." I got this. But, but do you have any idea why on first and 10 with 40 seconds or 50 seconds after whatever it was? No, it was, sorry, it was a minute and two left. But um, Lions with no timeouts, Falcons with three downs and a minute on the clock. Why you don't kneel that ball and run the clock down and then kick a field goal to win? Like, I don't understand why that wasn't what was happening there. The Falcons. Because the Falcons are a terribly coached football <laughs> team. I mean, you, you want me to be honest, there it is. You had two bad football teams playing this Sunday, and that's why I'm not buying into this Lions team, even though they are back to 500. I know they beat yeah. the Arizona Cardinals, who just won in a very exciting game against the Seattle Seahawks and have, in all honesty, Super Bowl aspirations I mean, this did year. you see that DK chase down? Uh-huh. Oh my God! I, I believe me. It, it uh, watching that football game, like just even paying attention to that football game, was exciting as hell. Like I, I honestly would rather have watched the play by play on the Score app or Bleacher Report than watch the Lions game on TV. <laughs> I know we beat that Cardinals team, but that Cardinals team, when the Lions beat that Cardinals team, it it wasn't this Cardinals team. It was a Cardinals team that beat themselves in a lot of ways. Kyler Murray made some unforced errors in that football game that allowed the Lions to take advantage and win that game. It's not like the Lions got a ton of pressure on him and made him make mistakes, bad throws, you know, turnovers. He did that himself, and he very obviously had a bad game in that one, and the Lions were able to take advantage and get the win. I don't think if you were, if the Lions were to, if we were to replay that game and you got the Lions from this weekend and you had the Cardinals from this weekend, I'll tell you right now, the Cardinals blow the Lions out by 21, at least, at least three touchdowns. Because if the way, if the Cardinals played the way they, against the Lions, they did last night against the Seahawks, there's no way in hell the Lions are beating that team. And that's where I, that's one of the biggest reasons I don't really be entirely, I'm not buying into this Lions team. I'm not ready to drink the Kool Aid. And it's because watch the Lions play a football game, watch them on Sunday, and now go watch a team like the Steelers or the Titans or the Cardinals or the Seahawks. Tell me that's the same brand of football. And I'll tell you that you're a liar because it's not. It's not the same brand of football. It's not the same caliber. It's not the same level of football. It's, it's watching two different ball games. Those teams are really good. The Lions just aren't, and they've proven that they're not able to beat good teams this year. They got beat by the Bears. They had a chance to win, but it was week one, and it was Mitch Trubisky. They beat the Packers for like a quarter. They had, they they got blown out by the Packers. The Cardinals, okay, that's a good football team you beat, but it wasn't the best Cardinals team. You lost to a good football team in the Saints, and mind you, that was the Saints' B team. The Lions can't beat good football teams. The Falcons are not a good team. They find every way they can to lose. And in all honesty, with how bad the Falcons oh, it are. Was, it was a lion-esque game by the Falcons. Oh, absolutely. It's, I feel like they've had a bunch of those this year. I don't think the, I don't think even the Lions have found that way to lose yet. That was a, that was a new one for me. <laughs> I, right. But <laughs> look at how evenly matched the Lions are to the Falcons. I mean, the, we saw how close they were in the running game in terms of yardage. Well, mm-hmm. the, the quarterback play was almost identical. Yeah. Almost identical to each other. 340 yards to 338. One touchdown, no pick to one touchdown, no pick. 108.6 rating to 105.1. I mean, two both got sacked twice for 16 and 18 yards. Like, mm-hmm. how much more similar of a game can these two quarterbacks play? These I mean, they're two very, teams... They're very similar. Like, Matt Stafford and Matt Ryan, I, I feel like have been compared their entire careers. Oh, they like, have, and for good reason. They're very similar quarterbacks. But these are two evenly matched football teams. And you managed to get lucky to beat them. What's that tell you about this football team? Because again, like I said, I'm not buying into them. You beat the Colts, a real good football team, a little different story. 
And we said it before. We said it actually last week for mm. us, for you and I to be jumping on this train again. We need to see them not string together two wins or mm-hmm. three or four. We need to see them be eight and three going a- after this stretch of easy games. Yeah. We need to see them get a big, big run going here for us to fully buy back in. Because yeah, that like, means that you beat teams you should beat, but you also manage to beat teams that you probably shouldn't have beaten. Yeah, like like I said, if if you if you go into those uh, next six games, if you start start off by beating the Falcons and Colts, you have my attention because now you, you, I'm like, okay, you have the Vikings, you have Washington, you have the Texans coming up. Like those are all very winnable games. But you come out six and zero, oh, then I'm I'm probably buying in. <laughs> I mean, point. you tell me that this yeah. team is eight and three going into week tw- going into mm-hmm. week thirteen. Yeah, I'm gonna buy in at that yeah. point. I mean, uh, you beat a good team in the Colts. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the end of the season is kind of a gauntlet for the Lions, but yeah. it'll be a different look to the season at that mm-hmm. point. They'll be fighting it'll, for a division at that point. It'll be bought in. Like, all right, now let's see if you can hang hang real playoff teams. Now right. you've uh, <laughs> you, you've shown you can beat a good team in the Colts. You've shown you can beat a good team in the Cardinals. Now let's see it against teams, good teams in your own division. Yeah. Now let's beat the Titans and the Packers. Let's see what happens in the uh-huh. Bears. But um, like the Panthers game, for example, that's I don't think that's going to be because it, it's looking like they're going to get uh, CMC back by then. Mm-hmm. So that that may not be as, e- as easy of a write off. That game ain't going to be a cupcake game. Yeah, because that Panthers team has one played well above expectation, and exactly. two they're also getting the best running back in football back. Exactly, and you know how the Lions love to play running backs. And the Panthers' weakness <laughs> on defense does not suit the Lions' strength on offense. Nope, not at all. So unless DeAndre Swift has a has an insane game or AP goes off, mm-hmm. that's the best way to expose the Panthers' defense, and that isn't the strongest point of the Lions' offense. Their their forte is not running the football. Now, now coming speaking of DeAndre Swift, coming in this game, news out of the Lions camp was that DeAndre Swift was going to have an expanded role. Apparently, that expanded role was they nine lie. carries. They lied. Twenty-seven yards. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Carry On Johnson was th- didn't even play. I don't think, but they didn't translate to more carries for DeAndre Swift, and he still saw about the same amount of looks in the receiving game, five targets, which is we we seen him get that. Right, which I'm fine with him getting five targets a game. That's yeah. fine, but. To see him cons- to see him still being out carried by Adrian Peterson, who in all reality has not done a damn thing this year. Mm-hmm. He hasn't done anything. Yeah. What reason have we seen from Adrian Peterson to, mm-hmm. that tells you that he should get the ball as the primary ball carrier in that backfield? There isn't one, but I nope. can certainly think of one for DeAndre Swift. Mm-hmm. I can think of a couple. And he's proven that at this point. Yeah. He he looks like a guy who could be something out of the backfield. He's young. He's talented. And he's already shown an ability to be successful for us. Adrian Peterson's not. Now, the other thing I will say that I do take some positive out is the fact that I this for the second straight game, I've seen Matt Patricia switching up the looks a little bit. We saw some zone. We saw, we saw him putting pressure on the quarterback. We saw him blitzing. That's I think that right there is a big positive I took away from it, and also the time management and just the game management in term in general by Matt Patricia. I actually I do take some major positives away from that. He uses timeouts wisely, and I'm I'm not going to sit here and give him credit for Todd Gurley going to the end zone, but like, <laughs> but he uses timeouts wisely, and he he allowed that team to be in a position and take advantage of the Falcons' boneheaded moves. So I, I do actually give Matt Patricia credit in that aspect. I do too. I mean it it was a game that seemed to be a little bit better coach than we've seen from Matt Patricia in the past. The defense continues to improve. It's not like the mm-hmm. Falcons offense is one that's just totally inept. This is an yeah. offense that's been kind of firing at all cylinders this year. Mm-hmm. We've seen Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley both be very successful in, in recent weeks. And Russell Gage even has had success this year. So to see the Lions not necessarily shut them down, because Julio and Calvin Ridley both respectively had solid football games. I mean, mm-hmm. Ridley six five for sixty nine and a score, and Julio eight for ninety seven. I mean, those are solid numbers. Are they great by any means? No, but they were able to not allow the massive game from one of those guys. And and yeah. both Ridley and Julio are capable of putting up that massive game against honestly better opponents. So mm-hmm. for the Lions to be able to kind of keep things tempered down a little bit with those who would not allow, not allow the big play, not give up the massive, 
the massive plays to guys who were massive playmakers. That's, you know, that's encouraging that that's something yeah. you want to take a positive out of. And you give credit to the defensive secondary. You give credit to the defensive play calling from both Matt Patricia and Corey Unlin to be able to keep Matt Ryan off guard and, and keep those guys under wraps and not allow them to beat you. Mm -hmm. So there is some positives to take from this game. And in my opinion, that's a big one. I mean, Jeff Okuda even looked a little bit better this week. He gave up for, yeah. I believe he allowed four. He was targeted eight times. I think he gave up four catches for 68 or 48 yards. Hang on. I got the number right here. 48. He gave up four targeted eight times, allowing four sets for 48 yards. I mean, that's not bad. Like that's yeah. not bad at all. That's solid. But again, you know, we got to have this continued success and continued growth on the defensive side of the football. And, and obviously with true font being out this week, Jeff Okuda did have to step up a little bit. And I know Amani or Oruari is starting to step up a little bit more too. Mm -hmm. So to see in Justin Coleman being back is obviously big as well. You know, he is one of the premier slot corners in the game. So take some of the pressure off of a guy like Jeff Okuda. So, to see continued growth on the defensive end and willing and ability to make adjustments to change up your game plan to make things work is obviously a very positive sign, in my opinion. Um, let's talk about Kenny Galladay for a little bit. So, another big game from him. He uh, came out of that game with, I believe, 114 yards on yes, six catches. Six catches for 114 yeah. yards. I still don't believe he has a score this year, but he's got he's starting to rack up the yards quite a bit. Yeah, I think that's two straight games of 100 yards. But you're going to have to pay him if you want to keep him, and he's going to command. He's going to command I some think, big money. Big money, probably uh, top ten receiver money. I'm looking like I'm looking around Amari Cooper range is what he'd probably command. Who I believe is the fourth highest paid receiver in the league right now. Actually, I would put uh, him a tick below that. Mm -hmm. I, I think Amari Cooper money, I think it's a little bit inflated because of the Dallas contract because it's mm -hmm. the Cowboys. I, I would yeah. put him just a. a Tick below that. So he does actually have yeah. two touchdowns this year. I, I was wrong. He's got okay. 20 catches for 338 yards and two touchdowns. But either way, you're looking in the ballpark of 18 to 20 mil, I believe, per year for Quite Kenny probable. Galladay. That, that puts you in top 10 range, 18 to 20 mil. So the question here is, we we know the value that, like we, we know if for a team new wide receiver, Kenny Galladay, well, in, in terms of the wide receiver market, we know Kenny Galladay is worth that money. The question here is, do you think it's wise for the Detroit Lions to throw big money at a receiver at this stage? Do you, uh, you think it's a good move, or do you think the money should be spent elsewhere? I mean, it's tough for me to say it's, it, we need to spend the money elsewhere when where's it going to be spent? Yeah. You know, if I don't have a, a contingency plan here or a goal set in mind that I want mm -hmm. the money to go here, then it's tough for me to say spend it there because yep. there's I, I don't know what's out there. Uh, and, and that's not a reason for me to say don't give it to Gaudet. Gaudet's absolutely mm -hmm. earned it, and we've made this mistake before. We made this mistake with Darius Slay. We, mm -hmm. We've made this mistake in the past. That's, and and that's I don't I want us to, to make the it. same mistake here and mm -hmm. not pay a guy who, in all honesty, has earned mm -hmm. it and deserves it. He yeah. is a top 10 receiver in this league, and he's proven mm -hmm. that. So let's pay him like one. Yeah. He, he's a guy who... I thought seemed like he wanted to be here. He seems to be getting a little bit disgruntled with the with the contract talks and mm -hmm. the whole it's going to cost you quote is if I were, you know, I'm quoting him yep. correctly, but from his Instagram. Yep. Yeah, it, it seems like he's becoming increasingly disgruntled with these contract d conversations here. But at the same time, he, he deserves to be paid. And, and mm -hmm. it's tough to find playmakers like that, especially from those third and fourth round positions mm -hmm. where you got him. So I, I when you find one, you got to keep them. If, and, like when you're when you're a team like the Lions, like this, this is your opportunity to have a big name guy. You can't just keep if you you can't just keep hitting on a draft like you had on Darius Slay and then just letting him walk instead of paying him. Like there, there there's going to come a time where you need to retain some guys, and or, or else you're going to have to keep turning this thing down. Because for me, the drop off from Kenny Galladay, our next best receiver, is scary. Oh, it's massive. <laughs> it's it's bad. Your second best pass catcher is T.J. Hawkinson. <laughs> exactly. Like, and, and then there's even still a pretty solid size gap <laughs> between T.J. and the next best pass catcher. And I'm I'm a guy who has enough faith in DeAndre Swift's potential. Where I'm like, I feel like if you re-sign Kenny Galladay, you develop Swift, you could have a nice offensive core right there. Like, so I I'm on I'm in the I'm in the camp of I I think we should give. Galladay's money. I 100% agree because let's think about this logically here for a second. 
where your money is going on your off on your offense. Okay, so you've paid some mm-hmm. money, you paid big money to your left tackle and Taylor Decker. Okay, left mm-hmm. tackle is a position that really deserves it. You're going to end up paying some money to your top wide receiver and Kenny Galladay. Okay, mm-hmm. but looking beyond that, it's your other playmakers on offense. Your quarterback, all right. Well, if you want to kind of rebuild this thing, you can still pay Kenny Galladay and do that. You know, trade yeah. Matthew Stafford, get a first round pick. Guess what? You're paying a rookie quarterback a rookie contract at that point, regardless of where you get him. Sure, nice to help help develop a rookie quarterback when you got a true number one out there. Looking at your backfield, your primary guy of the future is on a rookie contract. Your offensive line, besides Taylor Decker, you've got Frank Ragnow and Jonah Jackson, both on rookie contracts. I mean, mm-hmm. those na- those contracts right there are so valuable in why you're able to, why you should be keeping guys like Kenny Galladay because you don't have the money invested in those other premium positions that are going to cost you. Yes, I know Frank Ragnow is going to be expensive to re-sign, and you better keep him. But Kenny Galladay is gonna is one of those guys, core key guys on offense that you do have to keep. And like you mentioned, we can't keep finding these guys that are legitimately good and then just letting them walk. And and it's yep. a completely different situation from Darius Slay because in Darius Slay's case, you were looking at a thirty year old cornerback. That's true. We're all we're looking at like what a twenty six year old receiver here. He's a hell of a lot younger. This is a guy getting his second contract, not his third, mm-hmm. his second contract. So the age is also a factor here. And, and letting Darius Slay walk, you know, we don't know if it's a good idea, if it was a good idea, but how much is it going to hurt you to lose a 30 year old receiver long term or corner mm-hmm. long term? Because it very well could hurt you to lose a 26 year old receiver long term because you may not find that guy again, not where you found him. So I'm absolutely I'm, I'm bored with paying the man and keep him around here in Detroit to continue making some plays for us because he is, in all honesty, our number one playmaker on offense right now. Receivers not, are, are receivers are going to win you championships, but yeah. like it can definitely open a path for you to be a winning football team. That that is for sure. Like I, right, receivers like, don't win football games, but an elite one sure makes it a lot easier to to be in the game. Exactly. I mean, look um, at Tyler Lockett last night. He's a damn good receiver. Dude was on fire. He and Russell Wilson were the only reason their team was in the ball game last night. <laughs> I feel so bad. Like for me to go off like that and still lose. He's done it a couple times this year. That's the thing. It's, I think he's now the leading. I think he now has the most receiving touchdowns in the league. Cause he's had two games of three touchdowns. Yeah. Is Calvin ever, I'm trying to remember. I think Calvin's gone for 203 before, hasn't he? Yes. Uh, yeah. I think he's yeah. done it against the Cowboys a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, I miss him. I do, too. Believe me, I do, too. I wish we had more overlap of Calvin Johnson and Kenny Galladay. It would be a sight to see because watching those two, Megatron and Mini Megatron on the outside together. (laughs) Oh, man. I mean, that's a that's what everybody thought. Oh, who was the duo? Was it it was Mike Evans and someone else? What everybody thought it was a few years back, what they thought that duo was supposed to be. I don't remember. But oh, what's his face? I think I know what you're talking about. Was it Vincent Jackson? Yes. Yeah, what everybody thought uh-huh. Mike Evans and Vincent Jackson were going to be together. Mm-hmm. The two towers on the outside, <laughs> just dominant. How can you stop it? And then Vincent Jackson decided to forget how to play football. <laughs> <laughs> it always seems to work out that way, doesn't it? I know. I know. But we have a legit playmaker here, and we need to keep him around. So yeah. let's make it. let's make that happen. So real quick, let's look forward to next week. Lions right. versus Colts. I'm gonna see if I can pull up a spread. I don't know if there's gonna be one this early in the week, but we'll there find is. We, oh, there is. Yes. So right now, our current spread odds are Indy minus three. You know, I'm kind of surprised it's only minus three. I know the Colts lost to the Browns. Mm-hmm. I know the Colts lost to the Jaguars, but. The Browns game was... They've had their issues lately. (laughs) They have. They have. And they struggled against the Bengals as well. But this is a legitimately good football team. Phillip Rivers is obviously playing like he's 100. But he still has shown flashes that he can, you know, dial it up. But that defense is real. That running game can beat you. That passing game can even beat you. But that defense is definitely something that can slow just about anybody down. This Colts team all around is a good football team, and it's one that if you want if you want me to take this Lions team seriously, these are the games you have to win. You're going to have to 
throw out some interesting packages offensively because I don't think you're going to get away with what you're able to get away with against the Falcons. <laughs> no, absolutely not. If you play the way if you play the way you against the Colts next week and the way you played this past weekend, there's no way you, you you'll get blown out. Yeah, absolutely. But that being said, right now at Indy minus three, I'm surprised it's only three. I'll be honest with you. So I take a year uh, taking Indy on this then. Uh, yeah, I'm taking Indy minus three uh, mm-hmm. all day. I I, <laughs> I mean. Where I would draw the line and say, all right, I'll take the Lions is Mm -hmm. Lions plus six. Indy minus five and a half is my bare max there. Mm -hmm. That's that's the bare max spread for me. That's about where I'm at is is Indy minus five and a half in this on this one. That's pretty much my perfect line for this game. And Mm -hmm. I would probably if it was Indy minus five and a half, I would probably straight up just stay away from betting on the game. But anything underneath that, I'm, I'm leaning Indy for sure. Oh, it's actually sorry. I got an up, that one's for yesterday. I got an updated one. Minus two, it's uh, down to minus two and a half now. Really? Wow. Yep. So it's been mm-hmm. bet down mm-hmm. a little bit. And the over under set at fifty. I'll take the under. I'll take the under as well. But I think I'll side with you on it, especially at two and a half. Two and a half, I'll definitely take Indy. Uh huh. <laughs> definitely be taking Indy. I just think the Colts are a more well coached, mm-hmm. more well rounded, better football team than what we've seen the last couple of weeks. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll I'll take Indy, the Colts here. By the way, quick factoid before we move on to uh, some Pistons. Do you know who the Lions team leader in touchdowns is thus far this season? TJ Hawkinson. DeAndre Swift. Really? Oh, TJ Hawkinson actually leads the team in receptions, but I guess it's an asterisk because Kenny Caldy missed the first few games. Yeah. DeAndre Swift has five touchdowns. He has five? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Before we jump into the Lions, one question for that Colts game. Give me three keys to victory for the Lions up against the Colts. I'll give you one. What's your one? Make Re- Philip Rivers look like he's fifty. There's number one. <laughs> so make you're him saying look bl- old. Yeah, you can make him look old by blitzing him right there. Exactly. Make him look um, old. For me, it's so one one thing that I noticed at the Falcons game was it seemed like their D line was gained to Stafford a little bit too quickly. And again, Stafford got sacked I think twice that game. But for the most part, he was able to make it work. I don't think the Colts D line is a lot scary. The Colts front seven general is a lot scarier. You're going to need to step up that offensive line. That offensive line is going to need to step up in his pass protection in order to beat the Colts. I think that's going to be my first take. My first key to victory is off the pass protection. I agree with you 100%. The pass pro has got to be better because the Colts are mm-hmm. just their front seven is is borderline elite. It's it's one mm-hmm. of the better front sevens in the league. So you're going to have to find a way to slow that down. And in all honesty, the best way, in my opinion, to slow that down and keep them honest in, in mm-hmm. the pass rush is by giving what I would consider to be my number three key to victory is establishing the run. Establishing the run and controlling the clock is going to be yeah. important in this game because if you're able to get De- a guy like DeAndre Swift going and and making if he is effective in this football game, it's going to be tough to beat the Lions mm-hmm. it, because he is a guy who can beat you in multiple ways. And establishing the run is going to keep the pass rush of the Colts honest and allow Matt Stafford to have the time he needs to find his receivers and spread the football around to where he needs it to mm-hmm. go. So you, you want to break down yeah. that defense, you got to have a balanced attack. And to mm-hmm. do that, you have to establish the run. For me, it was going to be it was kind of similar to that. It was going to be spread the wealth uh, in terms of just in past. So if you look at the Falcons game, the Lions targeted one of Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, or TJ Hawkinson, 19 out of their 32 pass plays. You're going to need to spread the ball around a little better than that. You can't, you're not going to be able to zone in on guys against, the, against Indy. You're going to have to keep that secondary honest. So you're going to have to get guys like Marvin Hall involved or Jamal Agnew involved. That They're going to have to be involved in the pass game. Or I don't think you're going to be able to lean on a guy like Kenny Galladay all game like you were able to against the Falcons. I agree. I agree. you got to be balanced and you got to spread the ball around to beat a team like the Colts. So. Yeah, you, were, you were able to get away with being lazy on Sunday. It's not going to work next time. You were able to get away with <laughs> Straight up allowing a guy to score and him being <laughs> stupid enough to do it. <laughs> when that, so when they got that first down, it was a pretty impressive run by girl to get that first down. Uh-huh. I I shut down. I was like, all right, that's that's game. Let me let me uh, watch some red zone now. And then I'm like, wait, they're running it. Why are they running? <laughs> like I, the, we were out of timeouts. I do not understand. <laughs> it makes zero sense. It's what happens when you have a 
a badly coached, a poorly coached football team. So shall we jump on in over to uh, some Pistons talk real quick? Yes, sir. All right. So uh, we talked last week about potential Derrick Rose trade talk and trade rumors of him going to the Lakers mm-hmm. when we've mentioned in the past with him as well, going to the Clippers. Well, I kind of got some other news firing on the Twitter sphere and with amongst uh, Pistons pundits, the writers out there of Hooray for the rumor mill. Yeah, potential trades for Blake Griffin and whether or not the Pistons would be willing to move him. Gotcha. Uh, And this kind of is from what I, when I first saw it, it was Zach Lowe of ESPN who kind of came out and said, enough people have asked me what I've heard about Blake Griffin, how he's looking, that I think Detroit is going to have a trade market for him. I think it's going to, I don't think it's going to be strong, but I think there's still interest in what he can do to help you win. But then a couple days after that, James Edwards from The Athletic said still no one on this roster is untouchable finding a partner for a griffin trade might not be as challenging as it may have seemed even two months ago many teams have a championship or playoff window on which they'd like to capitalize and others may be looking to return to relevancy the pistons are one of the few teams with cap space this offseason so they could receive calls on griffin's availability and then he followed that up by saying, I have also heard a little noise about Griffin's health and availability. Now I don't get the sense the Pistons are eager to trade him just to trade him. From all accounts, the knee injury that forced him to miss most of last season has healed and he's feeling fine. The last time we saw Griffin with two working knees, he was all NBA and one of the league's 20 best players. The Pistons don't want to be a doormat and they appear to be confident he still has good basketball left in him with only two years left on his deal. So I before I get into the basketball fantasy land of potential landing spots, and potential packages for him. Curious to hear your thoughts on the possibilities of the Pistons moving Blake Griffin this off season and whether or not you like that idea or if you even want it to happen at all. Oh, I love that idea. Um, but it, I just don't see how like the teams that to me, well, we'll get into that, but in general, any, anything that's going to make the Pistons bottom out quicker and rebuild faster i'm all for it like blake griffin is is not part of this team's future and the longer you wait to trade him the harder it's going to be it's already damn near impossible so i i'm all i'm all for it i am as well again this team is not ready to win now and blake griffin only makes you a better basketball team and and Mm -hmm. i don't think they're a team that is good enough to win so he's only making it just elongating the mediocrity, in my opinion. And and so anything that can help this team in the future at this point, I'm all for. And if we have to trade Blake Griffin away for some young assets and in a bad contract, or as I, you know, my favorite thing that the Pistons can get right now, draft capital to go mm-hmm. with some bad contracts, that would just be the, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, for in my opinion. So I am all aboard trading Blake Griffin. I know he only has two years left on his deal, and it's a lot of money coming off the books, but it sure would be nice to be able to get something for it while you can. I wish they would have done it a couple of years ago when he was probably one of the 20 best players in the league, and he was all NBA. But, well, that ship sailed. Yeah. So, But anyways, going into some trade packages here, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on them. The first one is going to the Portland Trailblazers. This would see the Pistons bringing in from the Blazers Yusuf Nurkic, Trevor Ariza, and Rodney Hood in exchange for sending Blake Griffin to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, These trade packages come from NBAanalysis.net. Just kind of one of the first ones I saw that had some packages. So, you know, just want to throw some out there. So this would make it so the money would match up as I, if I be, recall correctly, but it would keep the Blazers core of Lillard and McCollum and it would add Blake Griffin to that core to make them in all honesty, a force out in that Pacific Northwest. So what are your mm-hmm. thoughts of bringing in Nurkic, Ariza and Rodney hood for Blake Griffin? The piece of that I find enticing is Nurkic and it's cause he's, he's still a decently young big. I think he's 25 or 26, but What's interesting about it is the fact that... Oh, sorry. Also, Detroit sends a 2021 first-round pick to Portland in this trade as well. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to break down Nurkic's contract situation, but nope, nope, not even worth it. Not doing it. <laughs> now take out the first-round pick. <laughs> take it out. Yeah. If we didn't have to trade the first-round pick, I find it interesting because you, you will end up getting Nurkic for these next couple years. And then if you want to keep him beyond that, you'll have to pay him, I think, unless he suffers a massive injury and is no longer worth 
much money on the market. <laughs> but right now he's getting paid, I believe, twelve million dollars a year. That's not that's something that's gonna that's nothing that's gonna really stop you from building around him. And I think the only problem is it, it kind of does make you a little bit better in the short term having him under center, but I, I think I would do it. I'd probably do it as well if the first round pick wasn't involved. And obviously yeah. you probably do have to attach a pick to Gr- to Griffin wherever you go with him because the contract is abysmal. I it's it, that's why he is kind of tough to trade is is because of the contract mm-hmm. and him not coming off of a great season like he did the year prior. It's tough to kind of really gain a huge asset off of it. Now mm-hmm. I that's do why like I said use it was of, like a few podcasts ago that I'd rather just ride it out than. Right. I have to give up. I would love to trade Blake Griffin, but if it costs I would, me to have capital. My gr- perfect just, scenario is he has a great first half of the season, stays healthy, mm-hmm. looks like you know an all-star caliber, an all-star type player, mm-hmm. and then you're able to trade him at the deadline. Uh, yeah. That's that's my dream scenario right now yeah. because it gets you out from the contract. He looks good, and you probably get the most value for him <sighs> for a year and a half rental to a, comp- a, a, a contending team. Now... Going back to that Portland trade, I am kind of curious about it because, again, I, I do like Yusuf Nurkic, but at the same time, if bringing in Yusuf Nurkic creates a log jam and doesn't allow you to bring back a guy like Christian Wood, is it worth it at that point? I like Christian Wood a lot. I think he's the truth. I think he's the real deal. I like, I'd like to see him back in a Pistons uniform, and I'm willing to pay him a handsome check to do it. I like the fact that he's as young as he is. I believe he's a little bit younger than Yusuf Nurkic even. He might be <laughs> right about the same age, but he might be a little bit more expensive, but I think he's also a little bit more dynamic than Yusuf mm-hmm. Nurkic is. So if bringing in Yusuf Nurkic meant I wasn't going to be able to bring back Christian Wood, I don't, I'm not necessarily all forward at that point, and I definitely don't want to attach a, a pick to Blake Griffin to just to get rid of him to bring in Yusuf Nurkic. So yeah. uh, I, I have to tread carefully on that one. Going to the next one, it's basically, so this one is also with the Blazers. It is the same trade, Oy. but the Blazers add Nasir Little, and the Pistons add that first-round pick as well. Yes, yeah, so basically you would have to, you just add N- N- Nasir Little and the Pistons first, and so I'm going to say no. Well, that's that's lazy writing. You just did yes, the same trade twice. Yes, it is very basically. lazy writing. <laughs> so let's just not even talk about that one. Okay, so here's another one. This one says the Pistons trade, and it's also the Blazers. Apparently, they really like the Blazers here. This what is going on? <laughs> I don't know. This one is Blake Griffin and two first-round picks going to the Blazers for Yusuf Nurkic, Trevor Reza, Rodney Hood, and Zach Collins. That's an... Oh, I like Zach Collins, though. I do but, like Zach Collins. But two for... No. Two first? Mm-hmm. Two first. So let's bump it down. How about one first? Blake Griffin and one first for those guys. Is it a first this year or is it a first down the road? It'd be 21 or 22. Damn. <laughs> I was like, I'll give you like a 2023, 2024 first. You give me Zach Collins. It's a guy that I can build around for that build around, but he can be part of the future of this team. That's honestly getting Zach Collins probably the best package you're going to get for Blake Griffin. I'll agree with that. But I'll still probably say no. Still saying no. Yeah, yeah. I, and I kind of agree with it just because of the fact that I I am very hesitant to trade draft capital. I'm trying to bring in draft capital here. I'm not trying mm-hmm. to give it up at all. Mm-hmm. So I, I am kind of curious to see, you know, I, I that so anything that involves giving up draft capital in a trade that it, for to get rid of Blake Griffin's contract. Again, I I this team isn't going to win anyways with or without him. So mm-hmm. and I am in we're in the middle of a rebuild. You can't give a draft capital when you're in a rebuild. So Yeah. I'm going to say no to any trade that involves us giving up first round picks to get rid of Blake Griffin. Now, I have the one trade I did see and I sent it to you a while back and it involved the trade with the Heat that brought the Pistons bam at a bio. How would you feel about that? I would love that, honestly. <laughs> I don't know if the Heat would be stupid enough to do it. Cause, but you, you went right down my alley because I'm like, I, because th- I was going to start giving you some just general trade partners, and like one of the top ones that I was looking at was the Heat because the Heat for sure. Because the Heat is a team that has cap space is a suddenly a championship contender, I guess, and um, they kind, they, I wouldn't say they have a vacancy at power forward, but they stand to improve at power forward. So it's it's an interesting destination for Blake Griffin. I think it's a it's a destination that you could maybe get something out of, but I don't think they'll give you Bam out of bio. I'll put that out there right now. 
I think they'd be but stupid if, too. That's but one of your they, future young stars. But if they did, I'm taking that. Uh huh. Because <laughs> a guy like Bam Adebayo is exactly what I want on this Pistons team. A future. And I'll young give you star. a first. <laughs> yeah, I'd give you a first in Blake Griffin for Bam Adebayo. Yeah. Heck yeah. Because in all reality, I mean, you want to throw up a 2022 first round pick. What are we probably going to get in that 2022 draft? It might be something good. It might not be. Is it going to be as good as, good as Bam Adebayo? Maybe not. Probably not. Let's be Probably real. Probably not. Yeah. So, so one that I saw. I don't know if so. This is courtesy of Sports Nut. Never heard of it, but I've heard of Sports Nut. I'm going to modify this because I think the trade. I'll give you the trade as it's Sports Nut. It's a stated. Canadian company. It is. Yes. Okay. I'll give you the trade as it as it's stated, and I don't think it's realistic though. So I'm going to modify it after. But as stated, the Pistons are dealing with the Warriors here. They give them their number seven overall pick in this draft with and Blake Griffin. In turn, they take on Andrew Wiggins' contract and get the Warriors' number two overall pick. I saw this trade also not long ago. I don't think that you are going to get that number two overall pick from the Warriors giving them Blake Griffin. I don't either. So what I'm going to modify it to is you get Andrew Wiggins and a 2022 first-round pick for your current number seven overall pick and Blake Griffin. Say that one more time. You get 2022. You're trading, you're trading your current pick and Blake Griffin. You get the first round pick in next year's draft, 2022. Sorry, in two years from now, 2022, and Andrew Wiggins. No, I'm going to say absolutely not to that because the Warriors are going to have a back end first pick next year. So two years from now, 2022, not 2021. Right, but you're, yeah. you're, the Warriors are going to be a back end. Well, ugh. so you're giving well, up Blake Griffin can, and your pick this year. For a pick two years down the road. No, I because I'm essentially and trading wins. back in the drafts with going to the back mm-hmm. end of what's going to be next year's draft. I mm-hmm. absolutely not. I, I will have a pick probably in the same spot at seven, then a pick probably at 28 or 27 next year, mm-hmm. uh, if not 30 or 29 right. with the Warriors pick. So, uh, and I like the top end of this draft too much. If we're talking the number two pick this year, four seven, and Blake Griffin, and we get Andrew Wiggins' contract. Yeah, I do that absolutely, yeah. and I believe I just don't we've mentioned see that why, before. I just don't see why the Warriors would do that trade. <laughs> uh, I don't either. I mean, you can look at it in a sense of the Warriors adding Blake Griffin and what is presumably a healthy Blake Griffin and getting rid of Andrew Wiggins' contract mm-hmm. to bring back with Clay, Steph, and Draymond continues the win now mentality while the door is still open. Because bringing mm-hmm. in let's let's be real, drafting a guy like James Wiseman who is expected to be the guy they're targeting at that number two pick. Does he really help that team win right now while the wind, while the door is open for them? You know, Steph ain't getting any Mm -hmm. younger. Clay ain't getting any younger. Data ain't getting any younger. So does he help them right now? Mm -hmm. And the likelihood of that is no. So if that team wants to win now, maybe they are willing to part with that number two pick to bring in a guy who's also ready to win now in Blake Griffin. And they get rid of the, problem with Andrew Wiggins contract that's a future problem so there is some legitimacy to and and possibilities there that that trade could happen if that Warriors team is looking to win right now which I think they are so if that were the trade in front of me I'd say yeah absolutely I move up to two to potentially get one of Anthony Edwards or LaMelo Ball yeah I I get rid of Blake Griffin's contract yeah and Andrew Wiggins is still young enough I'm not sure as a Pistons fan that would say no to that, to be honest with you. <laughs> no, because it gets you the potential superstar in one of those two guys, mm-hmm. and it brings you, it gets you out from Blake Griffin's contract, who isn't helping you win right now. And mm-hmm. Andrew Wiggins, I mean, is he a disappointment in the NBA? Yes, but mm-hmm. can he still be a solid player? Absolutely. And maybe mm-hmm. Dwayne at least Casey he's a can coach scorer, him. which we need on this team. Right. Like, and maybe Dwayne Casey can find a way to coach him up and get something out of him. I don't know. Is yeah. the contract bad? Yeah. But you know what? He could be an asset. So I absolutely would look to do that. Now, going into the pick next year and giving up your pick this year, I'd say absolutely well, not. Well, it'd, it'd be a pick two years from now, not next year. Sorry, two years from yeah. now. I'd say yeah. absolutely not because, again, I still think that draft pick's going to be in the mid to late 20s, and I that's not something I'm interested in looking at. Not giving up my number seven pick this year. Yeah, The, the reason I pushed it back a couple years, I didn't want to go as far as, say, like three years from now, but like because that, that, then that'd be just up in the air because then – Curry's contract would be up. I think 
Thompson being his contract here or something around there. But anyway, the reason I said the reason I pushed it a couple of years is well, one, because I don't think that the Warriors would trade the number two overall pick, but two, I, I thought it would add some in add some interesting spin to it by presenting a Warriors team with what it would be like a 34 year old Steph Curry at that point. Clay Thompson will be a couple years older as well. Like I, I like I think there might be legitimate but then again, I feel like Steph Curry's inhuman, so I think he's still be fucking awesome. He's he's also, inhuman, and his game also <laughs> doesn't necessarily have to rely on him. You know, the way he can adjust his game to be mm-hmm. just more of a spot up shooter, his shooting ability can be something that extends into his mid thirties. I mean, look at yeah. guys like Reggie Miller, Ray Allen, another one. You know, mm-hmm. those guys into their mid early to mid thirties, they were able to still be effective and very productive basketball players at an older age and Paul Pierce is another one. So he can be still be a productive player at the age of 34. So yeah. that's, that's why I think that Warriors pick may not be as good as it definitely won't be number seven. Now, but that, that begs a big question here. We, we, we discussed some, some trades, but in general, do you think there really is a market for Blake Griffin out there as Zach Lowe and James Edwards seem to believe? I think, I believe it was James Edwards. Maybe it was Eklo. One of the two said it best by saying, I don't think it's great, but there's definitely some interest. That's where I think it's it's a lukewarm market, in my opinion. I don't think every team is calling. I don't think there's a fire sale right now. People are, you know, a bidding war going on. I, I think there's a couple teams who have called. I think the Heat are one of them. I think the Warriors maybe one of them. The Blazers are probably one of them. Those teams that are kind of on the cusp of that championship or on the cusp of that conference that conference round. I think those are the teams that would be interested in him. And there's only so many of those. So I I don't think it's a bunch of teams where the teams wanting to get back into relevancy. I don't think there's any of those interested in Blake Griffin, but the teams that are kind of on the cusp that have that core in there that want to win right now while the windows open. Those are the teams I think that are looking to go after Blake Griffin and how much they're willing to part with, how aggressive they are. I don't think these teams are going to be all that aggressive either. Exactly. I think you're going to be dealing with smart enough teams that there, there's no way you're getting rid of Blake Griffin without paying. Like, <laughs> right? You're not going to get what you what you would have gotten for him two years ago. No, unless you can find a w- way to have him play elite level basketball for the first half of this upcoming season, then you can look at potentially getting some real assets at the deadline for him because a team really someone wants bring to back Arnie Kander. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So th- that's really the only possibility in my mind that you're going to get real assets for Blake Griffin. So hey, Ar- Arnie made T Mac function for a year in Detroit. I, think, I mean, he I wasn't think very can... good though. He wasn't T Mac, <laughs> T Mac, but like he fun, he was functional. He was more functional <laughs> than he'd ever been at that point in his career. All right? I mean, fair enough. <laughs> you know, I actually one more question before we kind of hop out. I was listening to uh, ninety seven one on the way home, listening to the obviously the two to six show. And they kind of painted a picture of Lions fans are on one of two sides of the spectrum. They're either happy we got the win, we're starved for wins, we want to win, we want to try to compete, you know, maybe make the playoffs. Or the other side of the token is you're a fan that's annoyed by the Lions winning a a football game like the Atlanta Falcons. Kind of what we let in with. What side of that spectrum are you on? Are you annoyed or are you happy we won? Like I I said, I am... I'm more on the happy side. I'm happy without being bought in yet. I'm not fully bought in. Like I said, I'm happy. You have my attention if you win next week. Like you have like, all right, you might have something here. I'm bought in if you rip off six in a row. But I'm, I, I don't think I'm by any means annoyed. Now let me paint this picture, and I'll play a little bit of devil's advocate. Because you're not. Because, you, I don't care what anyone says. You're not bad enough to get Trevor Lawrence off the field. That was never. No, gonna you're happen. not. You're not. Not with the way the Jets are, and no, yeah. you're not. Absolutely not. But. Like my question is, well, actually, Justin Fields is a, is a possibility because I've seen mocks put him down as low as six or seven or eight, and you could actually end up in that range. Interesting. And it's because the 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 teams that are down beyond the Jets, like mm-hmm. the teams that are down that low, have very young quarterbacks. So, well, Jacksonville might be looking for a new quarterback now. I mean, they were right. Jacksonville may be in that boat. Yes, Jacksonville <laughs> may be in that boat. But either way. And I'll play a little bit of devil's advocate because I am kind of cautiously happy. I, I'm a Lions mm-hmm. fan, so anytime we get a win or string together a couple wins, I'm happy. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, winning a game like that 
could end up in the future with us keeping the duo of Matt Patricia and Bob Quinn, and that's not a duo that I that, believe in. Yeah, that's, that's I, I a don't downside think of that. It. Like, I I don't think that's a duo that can ever take us to the promised land, win us a division, get us to the NFC title, or get us to a Super Bowl, let alone win one. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to be stuck in in as one of those good enough fans where oh they made the playoffs that's good enough for me or they won you know they won a playoff one playoff mm-hmm. game that's good enough for me you know i yeah. i want to be competing for titles you know mm-hmm. detroit was title town for uh, the better half mm-hmm. of the past decade or so not necessarily the lions but tigers were competing for titles the pistons were competing for titles the wings were competing for titles constantly you know the lions were the one true exception so this at one point kind of became competing for title town so i wanted include the lions into that and if i don't mm-hmm. believe that bob quinn and matt patricia are the guys to get that done wins like that can help them stay here and, and yeah. i don't want that because i don't want us to get stuck like i said being one of those good enough fans mm-hmm. i am happy they won but i don't believe in bob quinn and matt patricia enough to say all right i'm bought in yeah. I, I want these guys here. here here's my question for you then hypothetically let's say the lions Turn this thing around to a ten and six record at the end of at the end of the season. Where do you stand with Matt Patricia and Bob Quinn after that? I still don't they've think they've improved. They've officially improved on that nine and seven isn't good enough, and they've what by winning 10. one extra game and doing what Bob I know what Jim like, Caldwell did and still losing it, in the playoffs. I know, but like is is ten six like no? I still want them out of town. I'm like, oh okay, maybe let's see if they can. Improve well, look at the year. schedule. 10 and 6, in all honesty, isn't by looking at their schedule, isn't something that's that far out of reach. I mean, their schedule is they play a lot of the, bad football teams. They'd have to beat a couple really good teams. They would. A couple, it. though. A couple. A couple good teams. A couple. So you have a losing record against good yeah. football teams. Right, this right year. now, assuming that you are able, like I'm like I said, what it would take for me to be fully blind, if you're able to go six and over that stretch that we talked about. That means you beat the Colts, and that means you beat. You'd the have to Panthers beat the Packers the or the Bears back. or the Titans or the Bucks. You'd have to beat one of those also. You have to beat two of those four. Right now, mm-hmm. again, uh, let me ask you this: and you and I both are mm-hmm. guilty of this. We wanted Jim Caldwell gone. Why? Because he yeah. couldn't get it done. He couldn't get us to the promised mm-hmm. land. So if this d- duo gets us to ten and six, gets us in the playoffs as the, as the top wild card, because we're probably not winning this division with ten and six and loses in the first round of the playoffs, are we really that excited to bring these guys back? Because in all honesty, I'm not. I Again, I don't believe in this duo. I don't think this duo was good enough to get it done, and I think they would be beneficiaries of a easy schedule. Yes, they played a couple of tough games. They won a couple of tough games against mm-hmm. good football teams, but I want to see winning records against good football teams. I yeah. want to see us beating consistently consistently beating good football teams and if you're gonna go 10 and 6 and get to the first round of the playoffs and just lose well we fired a guy who did that consistently Mm -hmm. so why would we so for me i wouldn't say that like if they went 10 6 i'm all of a sudden gonna be preaching that matt trisha's a guy takes to the promised land that that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is if they go 10 and 6 we're talking a seven game year over year improvement and i'm like okay maybe he can build maybe he has built something here I would be willing to see it for another year, see where it goes. I mean, but in like, all reality, I'm not though, I'm going to give him like a five year extension for winning 10 games. In all reality, though, looking at the seven game improvement mm-hmm. year over year, is mm-hmm. this roster really that much better than last year's? No, Patricia was just not. terrible last year. <laughs> it, no, it wasn't even just that. It was you didn't have your quarterback last year. He, that he too. You didn't have your quarterback. So, mm-hmm. yes, I do think Matt Stafford, instead of that team being a three and thirteen team, I do think that team would have been more of like a six and ten or seven and nine win team. So, in reality, you what gained three, maybe four wins from last year. In all mm-hmm. reality, you probably were more of an eight and eight team because that's where you were last year to begin with. You were a. Mm-hmm. Three, three and one football team, I believe, when Matt Stafford went down. So, or three, four and one. So you were pretty much 500 right there. So you say you finished seven, eight and one, or eight, or eight, seven and one, or six, eight and one. I don't know. Regardless, (laughs) I I don't know that like three, four wins, or two wins, or even one win. I, uh, this roster, in my opinion, just isn't that much better than Mm -hmm. it was last year. So you get a false belief in those two guys that, oh, look at the improvement, when in reality, they really didn't improve. They just were healthier. 
at a key position. So I, I will say this. I have seen some improvements from the coaching staff. I have seen a willingness to adjust. That's Finally. a positive, a big positive. Three years. That's not something we saw last year. But at the Four same the time, before. if this guy goes 10-6 and six and takes his team to the playoffs and they lose... We fired a, co- a coach who did that consistently. So yeah. what's the reason for bringing this guy back? Is it because he did it one year, give him time to build? Okay, maybe I give him another year, but that's it. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't get a playoff win the following year, I ain't getting stuck in the Marvin Lewis hell. I'm yeah, getting I rid agree. of his ass at that point. I want to. Once he's in a point where he, in my opinion, if he brings his team to the playoffs, guess what? You signed your own death warrant because... You better win a playoff game next year or you're out. So anyways, now that's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you for joining me, Andrew. And thank you to Detroit Sports Podcast as well for always hosting us graciously. And thank you guys for listening. We will catch you guys next week. Follow us on Twitter at Real Fan Report. Check out our fantasy football podcast as well. The Fanalists. We drop that every week on Wednesdays. Give you some pretty good uh, advice, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say. I, I like mm-hmm. to think we do. I know yeah. Andrew sometimes with the starts of the week, not so good. But Hey, hey the Rojo <laughs> call panned out. It did. It did. <laughs> it did. But anyways, guys, thank you again. We'll catch you guys next week. This has been the Fan of Powers. Bye, fans. Forfeit. Have a good one. Peace out. Peace.